Hello, Brian here. This is Tim once again with uh, my Nightmare on Street 2 Freddy's Revenge review. So let's just jump right into this movie. Once again, I got my four film favorites Nightmare on Street 1 through 4. Number 2. Okay, let's see here. Nightmare on Street 2 Freddy's Revenge. The film stars Mark Patton, Kim Myers, Robert Rustler. Uh, Robert England is Freddy Krueger. The film is directed by Jack Shoulder. Music by Christopher Young. The score in this film is pretty decent. Not as good as the first film, but not horrible. Still good. I still like it. Um, Jack Shoulder as a director. He doesn't really even seem like he paid enough attention to the first Nightmare on Street film with this film. Because this film like breaks a lot of rules from the first Nightmare on Street film. In the first movie... Uh, the Freddy Krueger character could slightly like invade reality, like with the tongue coming out of the phone and stuff. But in this film, he comes into reality at the end of it in the climax, and he has like powers galore. I mean, he has all his powers. So this film pretty much breaks all the rules set up by the first film. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of fans don't really like this movie. And <laughs> I can't say I blame them too much for not liking this movie. I do think a lot of fans are way too hard on this film because I don't think this film is as bad as a lot of people say it is. Uh, I'll just go ahead and give my rating. It's a two-star film of a possible four. It's not a horrible film by any means. It's an okay movie. It's not a bad movie. It's not the worst in the series at all. Um, but it's not anywhere near the best in the series either. Um, it's nowhere near as good as the first movie. The problem with this movie is it trades the uh, cool idea of the Freddy Krueger character killing people in their dreams and everything for a typical possession story which has been done to death which I mean watch any of the Amityville horror films in that franchise and you'll know what I'm talking about but so they pretty much make Freddy into a typical possession ghost type character I guess I guess he's caught in the house or haunting, haunting the house from the first movie the Elm Street house because he has you know, he lost some of his power maybe in the first film in the battle with Nancy when she took uh, the energy she gave him back from him and so I guess now he uh he has to haunt the house, I guess, to build back up his strength or his energy. But there's never any explanation in the movie. There's no explanation given. So I'm like, eh, okay. It's like they didn't even give a fuck. But anyway, jump straight into the movie. You got Mark Patton. I like Mark Patton. He does good in the film. Yes, some people have a problem that he screams like a girl every now and then. But I would scream like a girl, too, in situations like this. And not everybody has a manly scream. So I don't really have a problem with that. That doesn't really bother me at all. But anyway, to jump straight into the film, this film does have the second, my second favorite opening nightmare scene in any of these films. You got uh, Mark Patton getting on a fucking uh, school bus at the beginning of the movie. The character's name is Jesse. So Jesse's getting on a school bus at the beginning of the movie. He's the new kid on the block. He's living in the Elm Street house that Nancy used to live in in the first movie. Um, and then all at once he gets on a school bus and it's fucking Freddy Krueger driving it and he runs out into the middle of the fucking desert. And the ground starts coming out from underneath the school bus. It's a really cool effect in Nightmare Sequence. I love this Nightmare Sequence. And uh, he turns around. It's like Jesse's on the bus with these two girls. And he's like coming towards him. And he starts like scraping the top of the bus with his claws. It's like really cool. Robert England once again. Terrific Freddy Krueger once again. Love him. He's the best. He comes towards him. Gets ready to swap right towards him. And bam. And then he skips to the next scene when Jesse waking up out of bed. And that was cool. I like that Nightmare Sequence. That was cool. You got uh, Jesse's dad is played by the same guy that played in Return Living Dead, which uh, which I like. I think his name is Glue Gallinger, maybe. I'm not for sure. Just a second. Well, Clue Gallinger, I think is how you say his name. But uh, yeah, he's cool. He's great. I love him. I can't get enough of this guy. He, he's one of the highlights of the film for me. Just the way he acts in the film makes me laugh so hard. It's unbelievable. I liked him in Return of the Living Dead. And here I like him as well. Every time just, uh, Jesse has a problem or a nightmare or whatever, and his dad's like, um, what, that, what that boy needs is a good kick in the ass. <laughs> Tell you what he needs. He needs, he needs a methadone clinic. <laughs> you got another funny scene where he's like, all right, son, we got two. I got two questions. You answer them. We can all go to bed. He's like, what are you taking and who are you getting them from? Oh, that was funny as fuck. I love that. His character just cracks me up. Despite the fact that he's slightly an asshole, he just makes me laugh so hard. I can't I can't get enough of him. He's hilarious. 
Um, problems with the movie, like plot wise, is like why is Freddy even trying to possess this kid? I mean, why would he want to come out to reality where he's weaker and just quasi human instead of all powerful? Um, that doesn't make any sense. It's never explained. Um, not to mention why would Freddy not just be going after the Elm Street kids again or the rest of them? That's never explained. <laughs> This film just seems like it doesn't bother to explain half the stuff. It's kind of like they just wanted to like do something completely different, which is fine. Uh, but um, you could have still built from what was established in the original and did something different from there. Uh, the problem with this film is it seems like it almost completely ignores the first movie, except for one uh, continuity holdover with Nancy's diary, which wasn't even in the first movie. But I appreciate the fact it was in this film, where they're like reading it, and that's what helps Jesse... Uh, kind of get the idea about how to defeat Freddy. Well, his girlfriend, anyway. Played by Kim Myers, who looks just like fucking Meryl Streep. Um, where she's, like, reading it, and she's learned about how uh, Freddy lives off the fear, or whatever. It gives him energy to enter people's dreams, and shit like that. I like that. That was a good little holdover. Sorry, itchy nose. But <laughs> that was a good little holdover. I like that. That's pretty fucking cool. Um, but anyway, so you got the opening nightmare at the beginning of the film. Jesse wakes up. Uh, through the movie, you get like, uh, you get some, the nightmare sequences, you know, mostly just Jesse being tormented, really, for the first almost, almost <laughs> the entire movie, really, for the first and over half the second act, he's pretty much just Jesse getting tormented. Uh, but, um, you get little decent dream sequences, not anything to write home about. This film has more of a creepy vibe instead of like the horror scary vibe of the first film. I mean, well, not horror scary vibe, but scary vibe of the first film. This film has more of like a creepy haunted house vibes. So that's what it's going for. But you get little scenes where like Jesse's like pulling open his drawer and he's like Freddy's glove is in there twitching and moving. And he goes downstairs and fucking Freddy's down there and he's like saying, kill for me, Jesse. <laughs> that's entertaining. A lot. That was okay. I mean, those little creepy scenes are entertaining. My favorite, this film does have uh, one really terrific scene in it that I love other than the opening. Um, it's got a scene where uh, Mark Patton's having a nightmare. Um, and, uh, fucking, uh, oh, yeah, he, like, sees, uh, Freddy, like, taking body parts out of, like, a boiler, like, reaching in there and pulling the body parts out. I thought that was cool. I really liked that. That was cool. And then, uh, fucking, like, Robert England shows up, Freddy Krueger shows up. He's like, I need you, Jesse. You've got the body, and he pulls his hat off, like, grabs fucking part of his skin, pulls it back, and he's like, I've got the brain. His brain's, like, sticking out. That was awesome. I love that. That was cool. That was cool. This movie does have some cool stuff in it. It's just the plot of it. It's just like with the haunted house thing, eh, possession thing. It's just so much weaker than the idea of the first movie. But anyway, so you get stuff like that. That's cool. I love that. And you get some creepy scenes where Jesse's like sleepwalking in the middle of the night. I assume he's sleepwalking, and he has a nightmare. He has a nightmare. He like walks and opens up his uh, sister's room, I believe, and she's in there dressed up in white, and she's like jump roping, singing the Freddy Krueger theme song, and uh, nursery rhyme. And that's really creepy. I really enjoyed that. Stuff like that uh, benefits from the haunted house creepy vibe of the film. And I really enjoyed that stuff. Uh, and Jesse's high school that he goes to. You got Robert Rustler there. I like Robert Rustler. I enjoy Robert Rustler. He's there and uh, he starts out as like uh, kind of like being a jerk towards Jesse. And then they kind of become best friends. Uh, which is kind of funny how that works out. They get into a fight, and like after that, they're like good buddies. The gym teacher is like, I believe the actor's name is Marshall Marshall Bell. Um, he was in Total Recall <laughs> in Twins, I also believe. He's kind of like a perverted gym teacher, I guess, or a child molester one. I'm not for sure. He like makes the kid like makes uh, Robert Rustler and, uh, and uh, Mark Patton. Well, the Robert Rustler's character's name is Grady. Kind of like makes Grady and Jesse do fucking push-ups like <laughs> every time they fuck up or do something wrong like constantly uh i guess we're supposed to think that he's in the bondage or something because uh, grady makes a comment that he like hangs out at queer s and m joints or something like that that's like okay <laughs> but, like any every person who is a horror f or, or is a horror fan or even maybe even a casual horror fan knows this film has a lot of uh homoerotic uh, subtext in it which i don't i don't have a problem with but it kind of seems like they were trying to make a different film and not really make a Nightmare on Elm Street film, but kind of make like a, a film about, like they wanted to make a film about a kid who was gay and struggling with being gay. And if you wanted to make that film, fine, you know, go ahead and make it. But it kind of seems like that's what they were really wanting to make and not a Nightmare on Elm Street film. So the tones kind of clash together a little. Like uh, you get the scene um, 
where Jesse is like having a nightmare, okay? He's having a nightmare. Typical thing. Freddy's haunting him, you know. Trying to fuck with him. I guess he's trying to wire Jesse down so Jesse would be easier to possess. I'm not for sure. It never really explains it. But, um, so typical nightmare scene. And then Jesse decides to, like, leave home. He just walks out of home and for some reason goes to, like, a bisexual bar. It's like, why? Why is he here? I'm, I'm fine with subtext in movies. And if they want to do, like, some kind of homoerotic subtext in the film, that's fine. I have nothing against gay people or anything. But if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But it has to make sense within the film. Why would this character go to a gay bar? I mean, in the middle of the night. At, like, what, 12 o'clock at night? <laughs> or 8 o'clock or 9 or something? I mean, like, what the fuck is he doing? Why is he walking out in the middle of the rain with his... To shirt barely on and walk into a bisexual bar and then you get a scene here with this fucking gym teacher like <laughs> grabs him and like takes him like back to uh the fucking school makes him run laps and i'm like it doesn't even explain like how he got him back there like did he kidnap him did jesse just go voluntarily i mean what the fuck happened but uh i don't get that you got another stupid ass scene in the film where Freddy like possesses two parakeets. Yes, Freddy possesses two parakeets in the film, and they run rampant in the fucking house, and they're like flying around everywhere. And then one of them, then they, well, it's one parakeet, and then it fucking explodes. That was so stupid. That was the most ignorant scene I've ever seen in a Nightmare on Elm Street film. That was horrible. But uh, what really helps this film is Mark Patton, the uh, character of Jesse. He's cool. I like Jesse. Rock wrestler, I like him and their friendship together. I like um, these. Yeah, these two guys are really likable. Um, Kim Myers or Kim Myers or Meryl Streep, whichever one you want to call her, she's fine. She's actually really the hero of the film because Jesse's more like the tormented victim, and she's kind of the one that has to step up and save him at the end. So that's kind of funny how the film just like switches towards the final, and it's, she turns into the hero when you thought Jesse was should be the hero because he's been. Film's been following him through the whole movie, his character, but he's not really the hero. But, um, so, it's just weird stuff like that, like where he goes to the bisexual bar. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense plot wise. Um, I just can't get any sense out of it into the story. I mean, I don't get it. But, and then, like with the gym teacher, he's like got him running laps at the school, then he fucking like. Jesse, I guess, falls asleep and Freddy possesses his body completely for the first time. And the gym teacher gets attacked and, like, hung up in the shower room and then gets his clothes ripped off and gets his ass whipped by fucking towels. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Once again, it feels homoerotic, and that's fine, you know, if you want to do that. But what sense does this make in the film? I guess maybe the gym teacher is into bondage and Freddy wants to use, like, the thing he likes, bondage against him. Or, I, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense, um, but then you get a decent scene where Freddy shows up and like fucking slashes the guy's back, um, and that was cool. And then like the showers like start squirting blood out. That was kind of neat. That was a decent little death scene. So Marshall Ball's dead or Bell, I believe, is his last name. So he's dead. Um, Jesse pretty much knows it's him, and that's when you get the funny scene where he's like. The cops found him, like, after he leaves the school, like, wandering on the street naked, and they bring him back, and his dad's like, um, like, just two things, son. What are you taking, and who are you getting it from? <laughs> I thought that was so funny. His dad thinks he's on drugs. That was funny as fuck. Um, Kim Myers, I don't really know why she likes Jesse so much in the film. He's, like, giving her a ride to school. You get a funny scene where she's like, don't you use a key to start your car? And uh, he's like, why? And, and she's like, somebody could steal it, uh, couldn't they? And he goes, what, the deadly dinosaur? <laughs> I thought that was funny. Like, like I say, I like Mark Patton. He, he's fine. Um, and the character of Jesse is fine. But um, uh, the, uh, his girlfriend, uh, Kim Myers' his character's name is Lisa. And she wants to th she's throwing like a fucking pool party. And uh, you get a funny scene where they're, they're like asking Grady if he's coming. He says, I can't. I'm grounded. I threw my grandmother down a flight of stairs. And I thought that was funny. And he actually is grounded, so it makes me wonder, did he really throw his grandmother down a flight of stairs? But I thought that was funny. That was pretty funny. Um, then you get to the fucking uh, pool party scene. This is probably the highlight of the film, but also the downfall of the film. You get to the pool party scene where Jesse's like, uh, Jesse's like, you're going to have sex with Lisa. And fucking this, like, Freddy tongue comes out of his mouth, like, lands on her breasts. And he, like, puts it back up in his mouth and decides to get the fuck out of there. So he leaves the chick and goes to uh, Grady's room. And you get the most hilarious line here where the character Grady is like, 
um, where, uh, where Noah Jesse's like talking to Grady and he's like, something's trying to get inside me. And Grady goes, yeah, she's female and she's waiting for you in the cabana and you want to sleep with me. <laughs> I'm like, cause I, I'd point that stuff out because the writer of the film was like, uh, he said that I think it was either the writer or the director one said that this homoerotic stuff in the film wasn't intentional, but it's like comes out so obvious. Like how could it not have been intentional? But I'm like I said, I don't have a problem with it. It's just the way that sometimes it's in the film doesn't make any sense plot wise. I don't think. But uh, so he wants Grady to watch him stay awake and watch him. Of course, Grady falls asleep. Then you get one of the coolest scenes in the film. Where fucking uh, Freddy's like coming out of his body, like ripping through his body in a really cool, effective scene. And Freddy's head like starts coming out through the dude's chest, and that's like really cool. I like that. And then he, uh, the the claws, like instead of a glove coming out to the real world, it's like claws come out of Jesse's hands, his fingers, and that's really cool. And he slits like the his chest open. Freddy's like comes out through his body. That was a pretty cool scene. I like that. No CGI. I loved it. That was a cool makeup effects scene. Oh, and uh, her special effects scene. And Freddy's makeup effects in this film, he looks more like a, he looks less like a burn victim and more like a witch. Kind of like a Hansel and Gretel type witch look thing to his face. Kind of like a slightly hooked nose. I think Kevin Yeager did the makeup, Kevin Yeager did the makeup effects in this film, I believe. And this is my favorite Freddy Krueger look of all the films. Despite this film not being my favorite, this is my favorite Freddy look of all the films. I love this Freddy look. But, um. So anyway, you got the cool Freddy look. He looks less like a burn victim and more like a, a witch, really. Um, so Freddy's out to the real world now, and you get a really cool, effective death scene here where he like walks up to Grady, which is a character I like because Robert Russler has a lot of great charisma. He fucking like grabs Robert Russler and holds him up against the door and like chokes him to death and blood comes out of his mouth, like out of the side uh, of his mouth. That's really cool. I like that scene. It's really, really intense, and the score really helps it. That's a cool scene. And then, uh, of course, it's, a, it's he's Jesse now, back to being Jesse. And he's, like, looking in a, a mirror and fucking uh, Robert Anglin standing there, straight Kruger, and he's, like, waving his finger at him like that. Like, <laughs> something similar to that. And fucking uh, uh, Jesse has the Freddy Krueger's glove in his hand, and he grabs it and throws it at the mirror and busts it. That's a really cool scene. Um, you, get, you do get some really cool scenes in the film, but you get some stupid shit, too. Earlier in the film, there's a scene where Jesse's, like, having a nightmare at school. And, like, the teacher's pet snake, like, gets on him or something like that, and he screams, and the teacher walks over and gets the snake and says, if you want to play with animals, Mr. Walsh, join the circus. And I'm like, what? Your fucking snake got out and got on me, man. If I was Ben Jesse, I'd probably sock that teacher out in the face. That was, that was stupid. That was that was a stupid scene. Not needed. It felt like padding in the film. You got another stupid scene where uh, Lisa's, like, trying to help Jesse. Um, she thinks that he's, like, having some kind of psychic connection or something like that, kind of like the people that help police solve crimes. Um, so she's taking him to, like, the old boiler room where Freddy Krueger used to work, and it just seems kind of like padding, and they focus in on, like, this, uh, fucking cabinet, and they open it up, and there's, like, a jump scare rat in there or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, you didn't really need that. That was kind of a useless scene. Seeing Freddy Krueger's workplace, though, was pretty cool. <laughs> but other than that, no, it, the scene was useless. But, um... So you get back to the pool party. Well, not well past the pool party, uh, but we'll get back to the pool party. No, 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 no. We're back at the pool party. Yeah, that's it. I don't know why I got confused on that. It's just cause I don't really like the final of this film at all. At all, I don't really like it. But anyway, here at the final, uh, after Grady's dead, Jesse comes back to Elisa's room, Elisa's house. He's like trying to tell her what's happened, and then she's trying to tell Jesse to stop uh, letting Freddy feed off his fear, and he doesn't even exist, and then. Freddy fucking, well, appears again. He comes out of him again. Uh, this is when the film stops being a nightmare and stops being in a nightmare and after she film and becomes like a standard slasher film with Freddy now in the real world chasing after the character Lisa, like, running around her own house. And I'm like, uh, just chasing her around her house and she's trying to slice at him with a butcher knife. Stuff like that just makes Freddy feel like any ordinary slasher and takes away from the coolness of him hunting people in their dreams and everything. That takes away from it. But uh, it kind of focuses in on Freddy's face, and uh, it's like Jesse's voice is coming out of Freddy's mouth, so it's kind of like a remnant of Jesse or a part of him is still left over, despite the fact that Freddy has took him over. So that's kind of neat. Uh, I like that. That was that was a, that's that's fine. And so he can't kill Lisa. Instead, he like jumps through this door and evaporates. And I'm like, how does he evaporate? How does Freddy have powers in the real world? Even in the first movie, he could kind of like 
just barely manipulate things in the real world. I, I get the idea that depends on how like from the dream world he could like do stuff like stick his tongue out of a phone and make phone calls or stuff like that. And I guess that depends on how many souls he has and stuff. But when he gets out into the real world here, he can like do just about it seems like anything. Like yeah, he can make illusions and stuff, which he couldn't do in the first movie when he came out into the real world. So it doesn't make sense plot wise. It makes no sense. I guess if we, you, get, you could rationalize it. You could just say, well, he has enough souls, you know, since the first movie. He can he can do a little bit in the real world, make a few hallucinations, maybe, I guess. But it's still, the filmmakers don't try to explain it at all. Uh, or the filmmaker, I mean, doesn't try to explain it at all. So it makes no sense. And I can see why Wes Craven would have passed on this idea because it is, infer it is inferior to his first film. So... It, you get that, Freddy having abilities when he shouldn't, and when you take Freddy out of the dream world and make him into like kind of an ordinary slasher, and he's at this pool party like slashing high school kids and everything, and some of these high school kids are like six foot something, or, and Robert England's like not that tall at all. He's not a very intimidating guy. He isn't, but what makes him intimidating as Freddy is because he's a good actor, and he can pull off the intimidation of the character, and because the fact that the character is in the dream world, and he can do anything. When you bring him into reality, uh, he's not as intimidating because he's like in a place where there's like, you know, like 19, almost 20 something kids, and they're all like fucking six foot two, half of them are. And so you can just you think that all of them could just gang up on him and beat the shit out of him. But, uh, so that's kind of flawed. That makes Freddy Krueger seem less intimidating when you bring him into an environment like that. And there's like a whole group of people like that in the real world where he shouldn't have any powers. That makes the character seem a little bit less intimidating. And that's a mistake to do with your horror villain. Um, but you do get some cool scenes here, though, still. Still, you get some cool scenes I like. Uh, this guy's, like, talking to Freddy, and he's like, uh, it's okay, man, just uh, calm down. I'm here to help you. And he grabs him. He's like, help yourself, fucker. And just, just, like, slings him out of the way. That was funny. I like that. And then you get a cool scene where there's, like, this fire coming up behind Freddy, and he's like, Sticks his arms out, and Robert England delivers this line very awesomely, and he goes, You are all my children now. <laughs> That's a cool scene. I love that. That's a great line. That's terrific. Um, and after that, he pretty much leaves, evaporates like into the wall in like a burst of flames, which is an okay scene. Once again, how Freddy has powers, I don't know. Uh, he goes back to his boiler room, the place he used to work when he was alive. Uh, this is when uh, the character Lisa becomes the hero of the film, and she has to go try to save Jesse. So she goes to the boiler room. Um, here you get some uh, like dogs with like human faces, which is kind of a neat idea. Not bad, but once again, how Freddy is able to do this, I have no idea. How he has power to make hallucinations like this in reality, I don't know. Once again, it makes no fucking sense. Uh, but she goes into the boiler room. Uh, you get some creepy stuff here, but kind of some weird stuff too at the same time. Where Freddy like had bit her on the leg in one scene earlier, and there's like these little ants and bugs and stuff like crawling on her leg wound, which is kind of gross and creepy, and I like that. Then you get a scene where she's like fucking walking, and she gets startled by this rat, and then it's like uh, wire cat jumps down and grabs the rat and like eats it, and it fucking like focuses in on the cat's face, and it's like got its mouth open, and it's got like this really loud like a uh, fucking wire like werewolf or Lion or something like that sound like playing or something like that while the cat's mouth is open. Uh, the cat has like razor teeth, I think, or something like that, or it's really sharp looking teeth. I mean, that was a really weird scene, an awkward scene for a Nightmare Never Get film, but it was creative. I mean, it was cool. That's what I liked about it is the fact that it was a weird and awkward scene and something I wouldn't have expected. So I like that. Um, next, you pretty much get the showdown between Lisa and Freddy. Uh, this, she defeats Freddy with the power of love, which I can see a lot of people thinking is really fucking cheesy. Um, but it doesn't really play it off really cheesy, so I don't really mind it. It's not too big a deal. So, she's like telling him that, uh, telling him that she knows Jesse's in there, like telling Jesse he has to fight it and everything. And Freddy Krueger starts like bleeding his like shoulders, like all his body's chest starts bleeding and everything. It's like where he's losing his grip on Jesse and Jesse's gonna break back out of his body. Like break back through Freddy, I guess. Uh, break loose out of him, kind of like he did to Jesse. Uh, then you get kind of a cool scene. Freddy's demise, I like, like how he, like how he dies. I like. I guess he doesn't really die. I guess what kind of happens is that uh, 
Jesse breaks the hold that Freddy has over him and banishes him from the real world back to the dream world. I guess it's kind of what happens. But uh, the scene you get, though, is still cool. I like this demise, though. Uh, you, you do get a scene where Lisa, like, fucking kisses Freddy to, like, show her love for Jesse, I guess, because Jesse is inside of his body, which I'm like, it's the only time I've really seen Freddy get kind of any action in any of these films <laughs> other than the the scene from Freddy vs. Jason where he's, like, molesting uh, Monica Kina, but that, that's not really... I wouldn't really count that, though, as action. <laughs> I'd count that more as, like, uh, just Freddy being a pervert, but anyway... So, uh, she kisses him, and, uh, Freddy, like, pushes her back, and then he got, crawls up like he, well, he, like, gets back and gets these bars, kind of like he's scared. And all at once, like, the boiler room catches on fire, and Freddy's body catches on fire, and he's, like, got his arms sticking out, and it's, like, on flames, and he's, like, Lisa! <laughs> that was entertaining. And all, you, like, see close-ups on his face, and the special effects look, look good here. I like this. His face is, like, melting away and shit. I like that. That was cool. And then he just, like, falls over. Jesse, like, uh, you, well, you, obviously they're trying to, like, trick the audience for a second, make you think Freddy's still alive, but it's Jesse who, like, raises up and starts, like, peeling off, you know, like, Freddy's burnt, uh, skin and stuff that was on him, and it's like Jesse has now come out of his body, which, that's cool, I like that, that's neat, and so him and Lisa reunite, and then you get, after, that should have been the end of the movie, really, right there, this next scene, the ending to this film is worse than the ending to the first film. The ending to the first film was just stupid. This ending right here is just outrageously fucking ignorant. This is the one of the this is the worst ending to any of the films. It tries to kind of do like the similar thing to the ending of the first film, except the ending of the first film was better, so the ending didn't bother me as much. And here in this film, it not being as good, the ending is is even worse. Where it seems like it's a couple of days later, Jesse's fine. He gets on his school bus. So, and then all at once, fucking Freddy's driving the bus again, the bus starts, like, running out to the desert, and then this girl who's, like, sitting behind him, who's, like, one of Lisa's friends, Freddy's arm, like, busts out of her chest, like that, and she's like, don't, well, right before he, right before that happens, she's like, don't worry, Jesse, it's all over, and all at once the fucking hand bursts out, because Jesse starts tripping out, because he thinks the bus is speeding up, kind of like the beginning of the movie, in his first nightmare, I guess he had at the beginning of the film, with Freddy in it driving the bus, uh, so he kind of, the bus starts speeding up, so he thinks, you know, he's having another nightmare, I guess, or thinks Freddy's back. But, uh, you know, all at once, you know, the, the person in the back seat is like, don't worry, Jesse, it's over. And then the fucking hand just, like, busts through her chest, and I'm like, then it goes off, that's it, that's the end of the movie. And I'm like, that is so fucking lame, that is the lamest ending I have ever seen in one of these films. That is such a lame ending. Well, actually, I take that back, it's not the lamest ending of the films. But it's at least top two. That is one of the worst endings I have seen. Uh, in film, it's one of the worst. And it just comes off as so stupid and not needed. Just like forcing out, oh, there's going to be a third one. Oh, as if you didn't fucking know that already. <laughs> you don't need to show. I mean, you don't, you don't need stuff like this to happen to characters at the ends of films. To let people know there's going to be a third one. Freddy is a character you can bring back. I mean, he's supernatural. Just bring him back in the next movie. Kill him off. Let that be the end of it. Then just fucking bring him back. You don't need to show him being still alive at the end of the film like this. Twice in a row. It just seems like a repeat of the first film. It's not needed. It seems like a repeat of the first film, except in, except in even an, an even lesser film. So it makes it even more fucking annoying. But... Other than that, this is a two-star film of a possible four. It's an okay film. Like I said, even with the ending, it's not bad. The characters are likable, and I still care about the characters. Jesse Walsh, I like that character. I feel for him. Mark Patton does a good job acting-wise. You feel for him. You care about him. Um, The character Grady, played by Robert Russler, you like him. He's very likable. Uh, he's fine. Uh, Kim Myers is Lisa. She's fine. She's likable. I don't really know why she would like a guy like Jesse. I don't get that. He, I mean, Jesse's a likable character and everything, but he, I don't know. There's just not really, like, really a love connection between these two characters that makes you think, yeah, they love each other so much. <laughs> That's just me, but they still do, they still do good acting-wise, and they're still very likable. Robert England, once again, is Freddy. A+. Plus. That's fine. He He's fine, once again. The homoerotic subtext in the film I have no problem with, but the fact that it just seems like it's kind of 
thrown in there to a way it makes no sense with the plot. If you're going to put subtext in the film, I still think it needs to be in a film to where it makes sense with the plot. And I don't think it makes complete sense sometimes in the plot. It just feels kind of like it's thrown in there, like Jesse going to the bisexual bar. <laughs> that was just weird. That was just didn't make no sense to me at all why the character would do that in the middle of the night and it raining outside. That didn't make no sense at all to me. Uh, the director of the film, uh, Jack Shoulder, uh, he said he didn't even feel like he needed to follow the first film, so I'm like, so you don't even care about continuing the first film, so then why the fuck are you even wanting to direct the sequel? You want to do something different. I respect that. I am fine with doing something different. I'm absolutely fine with it. But if you're going to do something different, make sure it's still good taking a character really creative. That's a really creative character. I mean, taking a character like that that can kill people in their dreams and turn him into just like a simple possession type story. And then giving the film a stupid ending doesn't make me have confidence in this new direction style. <laughs> I'm sorry, it don't. But like I said, this is still not a bad film. It's a two-star film. It's an okay film. It's still not a bad film. I definitely recommend watching it. I can see why it would be like a cult film and some people's favorites of the franchise. But uh, it's not a bad film. It's better It's better than Five, and it's also better than uh, Freddy's Dead. But uh, it's still... It's still a misstep. It's still a misstep in the franchise. And I can see why they rebounded back with part three. But it's still not a bad film and I have fun watching it. And I enjoy watching it. But I still I can still see all the faults in it and still know that it is a misstep film. But it's not bad. And the characters are still likable. And you still care about them and you don't want Freddy to kill him. Uh but the ending of the film just aggravates me so much because some a lot of the stuff that happens in this film would be ignored in future installments. Like, when Freddy kills all them teenagers at the pool party, you would think that'd be like, you know, news on the news. People would be saying, you know, some burnt motherfucker, you know, who looks really similar to this guy back in the day who was a child killer or child molester or whatever, was wiping out people in this town. You think that more people would know about Freddy's existence? But it seems like in part three, they're kind of like just forgot about it again. So that kind of, that's kind of, uh, kind of seems like they ignored that. They don't really ignore this film, per se, because it's still referenced in Freddy vs. Jason. But they ignore some of the stuff that's happened in it. And they ignore the characters that are in this film. They ignore the characters that are in this film. They never explain what happens to Jesse after the end of this film. Nancy comes back in part three, so that explains what happened to her. Somebody make a fucking comic that uh, that takes place in between the gap between this movie and three. Or an animated series, an anime series or something. To explain where the fuck these characters went and what happened to them. Because with the ending the way it is, you don't even know whose nightmare it is. You don't know if it's Jesse's nightmare, or whether it's Lisa's nightmare, or whether it's fucking uh, their friend's nightmare, whose character's name I forgot. Uh, so you don't even know who it is, who's having the dream, who Freddy's actually killing. So I'm just like, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> so somebody please make like an anime series or a comic or something that explains what the fuck happened to these characters i'm really interested i want to know i like the character of jesse i want to know what the fuck happened to this guy which is another reason why this film this film would have been three stars without that ending if they wouldn't have done that ending i would have liked this film a lot more but with that ending it knocks it down to a two stars so it's only an okay film but yeah it's it's still a, still a still an okay movie yeah not a bad movie by any means and certainly better than five and six and the remake so i do recommend that people see it so I'll, I'll see you guys again with the better sequel on Nightmare on Elm Street 3, but keep in mind this film is still an okay sequel, and I still do enjoy it. So I'll see you guys again with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors, which in my opinion is the best sequel in the franchise, and well, also in many fans' opinion, it's the best sequel in the franchise, and I'm included in that. So I'll see you guys again with my review for Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors.